Happy Resurrection Day. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We are celebrating the absolute core of the Christian faith today, that our Lord Jesus Christ is not a dead Savior, but a living Savior. He was crucified for our sins in weakness, but now lives by the power of God. He came down to connect himself with our humanity because the Word took on flesh. Then he connected himself to our sins and that our sins were placed on him on the cross. He became sin on the cross that we might become the righteousness of God. So he's connected with our humanity, our flesh. He's connected with our sins. And now we are connected to him in his life. The life that he has, which is resurrection power, eternal life. Now he connects you to it, to his life, through the preaching of the gospel. You believing in it, you believing in him, that is, in the truth of the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, now are connected to his life. His life pours into you and gives you eternal life, where you also will be raised from your graves on the day when you die. And this is what the apostles preached. This is what I'm preaching to you. They preached as eyewitnesses of the Christ. I'm preaching to you also as an eyewitness with them of the Lord's work. Now, of course, the devil doesn't like this, does he? He sends evil uh, apostles out as he did in the days of the apostles to preach contrary to this. And that was what was happening at the church at Corinth. There were certain people who claimed to be apostles and they taught falsely, contradictorily towards the truth. And so the apostle, the, the Corinthian church were starting to drift and to depart from their faith in the resurrection. Paul steps in then to reaffirm them, to slam the unbelieving uh, false teachers and to lift the church back up to the truth. And that's what I'd like to go with you through today is 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 28. And just take a look there. See how Paul affirms their faith that also your faith may be made strong and sure today in the Christ. So let's read it there. 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Now I'd remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold it fast, unless you believed in vain. What do we learn here already? He says, I would remind you, brethren. Why does he have to remind them? Because they were beginning to drift, forget. So that he's bringing them back to something they needed to remember. He says, I'd remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel, the good news, which you received, in which you stand, by which you're saved, if you hold it fast. So the gospel is the preaching of the good news that Jesus has come, He's died for our sins. He's risen from the dead. And this is something in which you stand. How do you stand in the gospel? By faith, having believed it. He says, this is a gospel by which you're saved. You go from death and condemnation to everlasting life, salvation. He says, if you hold it fast. What does that teach you? We need to hold this gospel to the end. Not just begin the race, but run the entire race to the finish line, holding this fast. Unless you believed in vain. Unless it's just an empty thing. Therefore, he told Timothy, preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. Be unfailing in patience and in teaching, he says. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. But as for you, be steady, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, Paul was dealing with evil, false teachers in his days. Do you think we have them in our days? There are those in our days who are preaching of Jesus Christ's resurrection not that he rose bodily from the dead on the third day, as I preach, and the apostles, but that he just rose, you know, in the hearts of the apostles. That's it. 
they were down after Jesus died and they were sitting in their little closet by themselves afraid and they thought, well, buck up little campers. We'll make Jesus rise again just by preaching what he said and he'll ro rise in our hearts and that'll be the resurrection. You know what that is? That's the devil's gospel. That is a false teaching, even prevalent in our day in the mainline liberal churches. That's poppycock. It's rubbish. What other words could I choose? I couldn't speak from the pulpit. <laughs> what I'm preaching to you today is the truth. Christ rose literally, bodily, from the dead on the third day. The apostles bore witness to it, and as do I. For Jesus says, this is what you must endure to the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. We stand in this gospel by which we're saved, we holding it fast to the end, God holding us fast in it. So we're reaffirming this today. And what is the gospel that we believe in? Let's look at the next verse and what he says. <laughs> he says, For I deliver to you as of first importance, number one superior priority, what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So this is something God foretold in ancient times, prepared Christ for from the foundation of the world, destined him for this glory, to die for your sins and mine. We have a lot of sins. We have a lot of wrongs that would keep us out of heaven and damn us eternally. But Christ, in accordance with this book, came at the proper time when God sent him and he bore them. He took them away. He died for them. He paid the ransom price. You are purchased and won and liberated. And he rose from the dead on the third day in accordance with the scriptures because we don't serve a dead Savior. If he died and only stayed dead, his salvation would be of no use to you. He rose, now applying to you through the gospel, his life, connecting you to himself. Now you live forever through faith in him. Do you believe this? What is the evidence that you have for believing this and holding it fast as something solid? Well, Paul goes on in the next verse. He says, uh, and that he appeared to Cephas. Who's that? Peter. And then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Let me ask you, according to Scripture, how many witnesses do you need to establish a fact? On the evidence, not of one witness, but of two or three witnesses, a thing shall prevail and be established. How many witnesses do we have here? We've got 500 at one time, 12 apostles, we've got James, we've got Paul. That's 514, he says, plus others. So 514 plus eyewitnesses establishing the fact that indeed Christ was raised bodily from the dead and was seen alive after his, resurrec after his resurrection. So we have much strong evidence to lay our faith upon today. The testimony of eyewitnesses, even 514 plus of them. Why did Paul... God, uh, Jesus appeared to Paul, by the way. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles. Going back here, he says, for I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, uh, because I persecuted the church of God. But the grace of God, by the grace of it, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. That was not I, but the grace of God which was with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Why did, why did uh, Jesus, resurrected, appear also to Paul, who's bearing witness as an eyewitness to Christ? Why? I appeared to you, he said in uh, Acts 26, for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and bear witness to the things in which you have seen at me and the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is what I'm preaching to you as well today, that you may be sanctified 
perfectly forgiven and have a place there through faith in the Christ. And Paul, of course, a ravager of the church, if God can save him, he says, if he can save me, the chief of sinners, he can save you and you and you. Don't despair. Your sins are not too much for the Lord. He can forgive them, and he has in Christ. And you believing it are saved. So this is all great, right, so far? What was the problem? The problem at the Corinthian church was that certain people who called themselves super apostles came and said, we're going to give you a better gospel than this one. And they started preaching and leading the church astray, even into unbelief about the resurrection, which is the core of our faith. Everything rests upon it. And so, did I take that little sheet out? Let's read it from here. He says, now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? He's coming to slap them across the face, basically. What are you doing? Saying there's no resurrection. What? Have you lost your minds? They were starting to uh, depart and think, yeah, Christ is maybe Savior. He dies to save us or something, but... He wasn't raised bodily from the dead, which is taught in our days in many churches. Well, what's the problem? Paul then comes to correct this. He says this reasoning. He says, but if there's no resurrection of the dead, check out what happens. Then, I added that part, by the way. Then Christ has not been raised. He says, if, if, uh, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be master representing God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he didn't raise if it's true that the dead aren't raised. For if the dead aren't raised, then Christ hasn't been raised. If Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, you know, those who have died, have perished. If for this life only we've hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. In other words, if there is no such thing as dead people getting up and living again by God's power, then Christ is still dead. And if he's still dead, you're in big trouble because that's a dead savior and a dead savior can't save you, right? He says, then guess what? Also, all of the preaching that we're doing is totally useless. It's of nothing. Then that means also your faith is totally useless unless Jesus rose from the dead, because that is what saves us. We're connected. Because I live, Jesus says, you will live also. I connect you to my eternal life. If he wasn't raised, then your faith does nothing for you. Do you see how it's absolutely at the core of the Christian faith that Christ was raised? He says, we're even found to be misrepresenting God because we're out here preaching. We saw him alive and he's risen from the dead. If that's not true, then we're uh, preaching against what God is teaching. If that were true, it's not true, but if it were, then we would be found to be fools and most to be pitied because we are bearing the abuse of the world. We are the offscoring of all things. We're treated as homeless. Uh, thrown into jail, hacked in two, thrown uh, stones at, and killed for this faith. And if this is not true, that Christ was not raised, then we are absolute, utter fools for living this way. We are of all men to be pitied, because we might as well just eat and drink and be total hedonistic pleasure seekers, because if this is the only life there is, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. So, uh, what does he go on to say? The very next line. Uh, there it is. Actually, look. This is what I was looking for earlier. I got it here, and I got it here, though. The next line says this. But in fact, say those words with me. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He says, what I've just shared with you previously was just a hypothetical negative situation to get you back to truth, to a fact, to reality, that God raised Christ truly, bodily, on that third day. 
And of that, we are witnesses, plus 514 more of us bearing witness to this fact. And now, what is the fruit of this? Well, we read, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. What is the great benefit of the core of our faith that Christ was crucified, died, and raised bodily? Is this, by Adam everything fell into disaster, into destruction, into death. By one man came guilt on the whole human race. Even if you read Romans chapter 8, the entire creation fell into futility, subject to decay. As you see looking outside, all the creatures suffer and die as well. By Adam, since he was the king, the head of the human race, when he fell and lost his crown in a sense, or turned aside from God, so his creation, all of, sorry, all of his kingdom fell with him into curse and darkness and death. But as by a man, Adam came death, by a man, Jesus Christ, has now also come the resurrection of the dead. Because at the core, Christ being raised now reestablishes not only you, but the creation has been reconciled to God. And all glory to Jesus forever, he has restored paradise and one far superior to that one which was at the beginning. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, says Paul, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all men sinned, so now also in Christ will all be made alive. So he's reversed everything that Adam brought into the world. Christ said, I'm taking all of these things and I'm going to restore them. That's why he's called the second Adam. Christ was the Son of God, amen? amen? Created by God's own breath and hands. Jesus is the Son of God, perfect, being God himself in the flesh. Adam can do all this to, to damn you. Christ can do all this to save and resurrect you and give you eternal life and destiny in his world of life, the resurrection. So the next line says, but each in his own order. So if all these great benefits are coming to you in Jesus Christ of you're going to be really raised from your graves and get up alive out of where you were dead, well, why don't we see the benefits and fruits of this already? Because each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So what we're celebrating today, that Christ raised, was raised from the dead, is what we celebrate is going to happen to you. We're all going to the graves, friends. We're going to die. Our flesh will go into that earth as we buried you know, Twyla on Friday. But so also shall all those who belong to Christ be raised. But when? It's just a matter of timing at the last day. Now, do you already have some benefits to this resurrection? Are you not also already raised in Christ in your spirit? We are. I do have this footnote over here, by the way. Did that one fall out too? No, here it is. It says in Colossians chapter 2, you were buried with Christ in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God. So as I look at you today, are you actually already resurrected in spirit? You were buried in baptism, you were raised, and now how are you different from the rest of the world? How has Christ's resurrection already changed you? Well, unlike the world, your eyes now spiritually are open. I see the Savior. He's before me. I, by faith, I see him. My ears are hearing his word preached today, and I'm believing it because my ears are alive. My hands are now reaching out to the poor and doing his deeds. My feet are walking in his paths, which he has given to us, the path of life. Your spirit is resurrected, and your body as a vehicle is following in the ways of life as your spirit leads, as it's led by the Holy Spirit. So there's already marvelous things at work in you through his resurrection, but not your body yet. Your body is to be raised as the latter fruits, the later crop. Jesus says, don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming. It's coming. 
when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. What a fearsome day is upon us very soon coming to this world for those who are evil, they shall be raised to be damned, but those who are in Christ, who belong to him, shall be raised to inherit the world, the kingdom to come, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he's going to appear a second time at his return, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let me ask you a personal question right now. Answer it in your heart. Are you eagerly waiting for the return of our risen living Savior? He's at the right hand and he's coming again on the clouds with power and great glory. Paul goes on, verse 24, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. So what's our risen Savior doing right now? Crushing one by one, sequentially destroying all of his enemies. They are being put under his feet. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Therefore, I would say to you, God says to you, be not afraid of all the evil that you see raging in our world today. Isn't it on the rampage? I mean, the exposure of the sin and wickedness of man and the devil's uh, armies uh, marching across the earth at present time in evil ways, it can be seen to be, oh, but do not be afraid of them. God is putting them under his feet, under Jesus' feet. Stand fast in your faith. God is only bringing them out this way to destroy them. They are uh, raging because their time is but very short. The devil has come to you and down to you in great wrath, says the scripture, because he knows that his time is short. It's almost up. That's what we're seeing in our day. Therefore, don't be afraid because... You are sons of light. They are an army of paper. Say that, army of paper. You, we have at our head Jesus Christ, who is light and fire, and they will just be burned up by his appearing. And you are also more than conquerors through him who loved you. And guess what? We're heading towards daytime, friends. We're heading towards you know, we're experiencing the last rushes of cold air of nighttime. That's what we're experiencing right now. And the true light is already shining. The sun is almost up. Nay, rather, the sun is almost down. He's coming. Daylight is here. The last enemy, verse 26, to be destroyed is death. Wouldn't you think it'd be Satan? Well, Satan... At the suggestion of Satan, man fell into sin, but our great enemy ultimately is death. That's what's uh, ravaging the world, but that is the last enemy to be destroyed. When all the rest have been subjected to him, then Christ will take death itself and cast it into the lake of fire. And at that point, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. This is what's before you, just over the horizon. The first heaven and the first earth, right now, is going to pass away. And then there'll be a loud noise, a voice from the throne, and it shall say this, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. Are you looking forward to this? Hooray! He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. It's over. No more death. And they, there shall be no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. All those are former things that have now passed away. And he who sat upon the throne, he will say, Behold, I make all things new. This is where you're heading, and this is the core of Christ's resurrection. This is what it has achieved for you. A brand new world, and you resurrected in it. God with you, you with God, in love, eternal, in eternal victory songs and joys. This, Jesus says in Revelation, write this, for these words are trustworthy 
and true. Let your first faith be made firm in it today. For God has put all things under his feet. Feet, verse 27. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it's plain that he has accepted who put all things under him. Who's the one person not under Jesus' feet? God the Father. When Jesus, as the Son, the Prince of Heaven, has conquered everything and restored all things to God, he'll then just turn to the Father, bow his knees, and then boom! God's everything to everyone, and all things are right and good again, and that into eternity. This is what we're after, and this is the hope of the resurrection, what it has achieved for us. The splendorous kingdom forever, you in it alive. And therefore, let's conclude on these things today and say, let's therefore be on guard against all false teachers. It's not buck up little campers he raises in your hearts, although... He's certainly alive in our hearts as well. It's he was bodily crucified, buried, raised. It's eyewitness facts. It, ha it is the reality. It is the truth. This is the gospel by which you are saved, in which you are standing, and we are holding it fast, and you will be held fast because God is holding you fast, keeping you personally for that day by his own power. And all this based on Christ's resurrection and power of his eternal life. Therefore, good friends, rejoice. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.